Hello, good evening everyone. My name is Jenny Hall and I'm the Assistant Director of Education at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of the Lenape people and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to, to Lenape people and elders and an ancestors past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I am glad to welcome you for to tonight's conversation with a book launch, which is being sold at the New Museum store, and celebratory conversation on an incomplete archive of activist art with the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation. We are welcoming our panelists and moderator, Vivian Crockett, curator of contemporary art at the New Museum, who will be in discussion with artists whose practices engage community building, organizing, pedagogy, and resistance. Mayfield Brooks, Avram Finkelstein, Guadalupe Maravilla, and unfortunately, Camila Janan Rashid is unable to join us this evening. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I'll begin by sharing a brief bi biographical note on our speaker. Mayfield Brooks is a movement-based performance artist, vocalist, urban farmer, writer, and wanderer based in Lenape Hoking, also known as Brooklyn, New York. They are the 2021 recipient of the Merce Cunningham Award from the Foundation for Contemporary Arts and a 2021 Bessie Award nominee for their exper experimental dance film, Whale Fall. Currently, Brooks is a 2022-23 Hodder Fellow at Princeton University. Brooks finds joy in teaching and traveling internationally and going off the grid from time to time. Brooks' entire body of work arises from their life art movement pr practice, improvising while black. They received a BA from Trinity College, an MA in performance studies from Northwestern University, an MFA from the U University of California, Davis. Mayfield Brooks is joining us via Zoom from a residency at, at Museum Sush in Switzerland. And I know that it's almost midnight, or maybe now one o'clock over there. So hi, Mayfield, thank you for joining us today. Um, Abram Finkelstein is an artist and writer and a founding member of Silence Equals Death Project and Grand Furry Collectives. He, is, he has work in the permanent collections at the Museum of Modern Art, Whitney Museum of American Art, Metropolitan Museum of Art, New Museum, and Brooklyn Museum. He is also included in the Oral History Project at the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. His book, After Silence, A History of AIDS Through Its Images, was nominated for an International Center of Photography Infinity Award in Critical Writing and Research. He has been interviewed by the New York Times, um, Freeze, Art Forum, The New Yorker, and Interview. He has had speaking engagements at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Princeton, and NYU. He is currently in residence at the Sharp Walenta Studio Program. Guadalupe Maravilla is a transdisciplinary visual artist, choreographer, and healer. At the age of eight, Maravilla was part of the first wave of unaccompanied, undocumented children to arrive at the United States border in the 1980s as a result of the Salvadoran Civil War. Maravilla grounds his practice in the historical and contemporary context belonging to undocumented and cancer communities. Maravilla has exhibited in major museums such as the Museum of Modern Art and Whitney Museum of America Art and is, an, is a 2019 recipient of the Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. Now, I would particularly like to thank the New Museum staff, Vivian Crockett, Monique Fuentes, Education and Public Engagement staff members, Austin DuBose, Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. We also thank our members and supporters like you who helped make this program possible. This evening's program is generously co-presented by the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation. I'd like to additionally thank Anjali Nando Diamond, Charles D'Agustin, and George, George Bolster for their collaboration in planning this evening's conversation and book launch. Without further ado, I will pass this on to the, to the artistic director of the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, Anjali Nanda Diamond. Thank you, Ginny. Um, good evening and welcome everyone to the new museum um, to celebrate the launch of our new book, An Incomplete Archive of Activist Art, which reflects the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation's art and social justice initiative over the past six years and features thematic essays, roundtable discussions, newly commissioned artworks, and documentations of visual art exhibitions. 
Thank you to our panelists, each of whom were involved in our exhibitions and programs over the years, and a huge thank you to all of the artists whose work made this book possible. It's so nice to see some of you in the audience here tonight. An incomplete archive of activist art shines a light on practices embracing community, and tonight's panelists reflect that ethos. It addresses artists, art forms, and art forms that raise consciousness and endeavor to build a collective sense of well-being. It also serves as a microcosm of a particular cultural shift in the artistic landscape of New York City. Thank you to the writers, Andre Lepecki, Lucy Lepard, and Sarah Reisman for their incisive and thought-provoking essays, the poets Mel Chin and Claudia Rankine for their poignant and personal contributions, the artists Hockey Ivy, Edgar Heap of Birds, Dred Scott, Mara Later Manukulis, and Camila Janan Rashid, who produced enriching works for this publication. I would like to acknowledge my co-editors, Sarah Reisman and George Bolster, and express gratitude to Shelley Rubin, whose dedication to art and social justice allowed us to take risks and experiment in each of our programs and exhibitions. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Vivian Crockett, and I'd like to extend a thank you to all of the staff at the New Museum for generously hosting this book launch, um, especially the events team, Austin Bowes, Ginny Howe, and Jungju Park, as well as the foundation's manager of events and communications, Charles D'Agustin, for ha all of their work in producing tonight's program. And with that, on to you, Vivian. Thank you all for braving the rain to be with us today. I'm so, so excited to be in dialogue with all of you here and um, evoking the energy and spirit and brilliance of Camila, who's not here with us. Um, I actually wanted to, you know, the, the format for this will be a kind of popcorn weaving of everyone in the spirit of collectivity. So I ask that you not give away all of your gems at once. And I, I promise we'll make space to talk about it all. Um, but I wanted to begin with thinking about the kind of political stakes, the political urgency, the political significance of our lived experiences, and the ways that in each of your works, um, your personal experiences have really guided your framework towards collective care, um, and also your personal histories. Um, Camila you know, has spoken in other contexts about her father converting to Islam and photocopying these religious texts and annotating them, and that being a kind of parallel to her own practice. And then um, you, Abram, have talked about, you know, also growing up with some lefty parents and um, how you were brought up under this model of kind of collective liberation um, from a very early age. And I've heard you speak about silence equals death as this kind of mode of expressing collectivity, a collective um, formation. And I think it's so, so significant to have you in the space in the new museum, given the history of um, your work in the 80s related to that. We can speak a little bit about that. And then um, Lupe, you know, one of the, the striking stories that I've heard you tell is about, among many things, you know, playing tripa chuka um, as a child um, navigating a very long um, migration process and how you've integrated that and you've made sure to integrate that into you know, pretty much every project you've done since. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit about you know, some of your work with undocumented communities and how that has informed your practice. And there's much, much to say about the work you've been doing, but as a kind of jumping off point, and then last but not least, Mayfield, um, one of the projects that I think would be really interesting to talk about in this um, context is Viewing Hours, which is a project that you presented on the, at the eighth floor um, at the Rubin Foundation. And thinking about that maybe through the kind of framework of Christina Sharp and this notion of wake work, what it means to kind of contend with anti-black violence and death as a collective process and a collective responsibility and how that's connected to um, this notion that you've invoked of decomposition. Um, so lots of prompts there, but whoever wants to start first, we also have some images to guide us along the way and um, yeah, we'll, we'll see where the conversation takes us from there. 
<laughs> it's on. Oh, it's, it's on. ready for you. Are we do oh. So it's great to be back at the scene of the crime, as it were. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have notes so I don't go down a rabbit hole, but I might anyway. So I, I wanted to uh, show this slide because way before Prada uh, discovered Lower Broadway, the new museum used to be there. Um, and one of the tasks that um, I was assigned within the Silence Equals uh, Death Collective was to negotiate the service that sniped those posters um, and also to make recommendations for locations. And because the new museum had just had this amazing Hans Hacke show, I suggested that we, we paste across from the new museum. And as a result of that, um, curator Bill Olander decided to offer the windows of uh, ACT UP, uh, the windows of the new museum to ACT UP, which is the reason why the silence equals death neon sign is in the new museum. So I wanted to sort of situate it a little bit. Could you change the slide? So, I took this Polaroid of the person um, I was, I had decided to build my life around in 1981. By 1984, he was dead. Um, and he's the reason actually why I helped co-found the Silence Equals Death Collective. Would you mind uh, going to the next image? So this is a drawing that, um, I made in 2019. I've drawn my entire life, but after a stroke that was precipitated by the discovery that most people have three aortic valves, I apparently lived my entire life with one. Um, and I, soon after the heart surgery had a, a stroke, and while I was in residency at, the, um, at Pioneer Works, I decided to start drawing again, and what I discovered really startled me. My disobedient hand no longer belongs to me, and it dictates its own language, um, which I've decided to begin listening to. Uh, this uh, drawing that you're looking at uh, was based on the Polaroid. Um, could you switch to the next slide? This is a drawing based on that same source material a year later. It was done um, uh, with, uh, in early 2022. So as a queer artist, I would say that my practice is always centered on the rejection of prior imaginings of the body and is touched on the tensions uh, between legibility and limitation, marking and erasure, identity and colonization, and agency and refusal. I've, I've also gravitated towards public spaces uh, in an attempt to reflect questions of, uh, of access. But I'm currently considering non-traditional art spaces, and in fact all spaces, less in terms of their publicness and more in the terms of the ways in which they're shared, which I think is a, actually a more accurate metric for defining accessibility. Um, could you switch to the next slide? So as a consequence of that, I, I increasingly deploy translucent or transparent lightweight materials such as um, vellums and voils to articulate memory as an object that casts a shadow, but more importantly, that responds to the, that activates the social space in a way that res responds immediately to the spectator, the, the, the wind of the spectator, um, as can be seen here in, um, in this, installation that was actually about, <laughs> about the lack of COVID-19 preparedness um, in America. So I, to sum it up, I would say that the 
my work has always been um, integrated within feminist critiques, uh, but I believe that the, the, uh, the feminist critiques or analysis of the body also foregrounds current questions, um, in particular displacement, transition, and hierarchy. Great. I have many, many more questions and thoughts for you, but we'll get I'm there sure you eventually. Do. <laughs> Mayfield or um, Guadalupe, do either of you want to speak next? Mayfield, I Hi. think it's up to you. Go ahead. Uh, I, I actually would love to just um, see the slides if possible. Thank you. Are you able to see them in Zoom world? Yes, Great. now I can see them. I, I wasn't able to see Avram's slides. Oh, that's too bad. Okay. Um, but I guess what I'm thinking about right now, this is a this is a slide of viewing hours. And uh, I actually performed viewing hours four times in four different spaces in four different seasons. So this is at the kitchen and it is in their uh, kitchen slash or what was they're kind of under construction right now. Um, their kitchen slash office space. And I set up, uh, this is actually the first uh, performance of viewing hours and I set it up on their conference table. <laughs> and uh, after that, I performed a year, actually, I think it was a year later that I performed it at the eighth floor in the gallery. Um, and two other times, I performed it at Jack in their dressing room and in the theater dressing room. And uh, the other time was actually at Mount Tremper in upstate New York in their garden, where I performed it as a ritual with, um, with just black artists. Uh, and then um, in the evening, in the daytime, I performed it with a group of black artists from New York. And then in the evening, I performed it for the public. And so I think that this, this particular uh, gesture or what I'm calling decomposing dance or choreographing breath was my way of embracing mourning um, as part of my as part of my practice. Uh, I've been working I have been working as an urban farmer, urban gardener for over 20 years and dancing <laughs> and maybe I was mourning all that work I did <laughs> the labor of being an artist and also having a day job as a laborer uh, but also calling up um, ancestors and I, I you know related to um, some of what was just spoken um, one ancestor in particular Marsha P. Johnson was a major um, inspiration for this piece because she was someone who I I I felt like we we might have crossed paths the year that she died because the year she died I was in New York City in college. Uh, becoming an artist and I was 20 years old and studying at the La Mama Theater, running around New York, seeing as many shows as I could see, figuring out my queerness, um, you know, everything. And Audre Lorde also died that year. And I remember Audre Lorde's passing, but I hadn't known about Marsha P. Johnson. I didn't know about her. 
and I didn't learn about her until later. And so it was interesting to kind of realize how as a queer person, I had been somehow cheated out of knowing about this incredible ancestor. And so I started writing letters to her. And as I was working up in the Bronx, you know, running this urban farm and then dancing downtown, and I was growing all these flowers and um, really thinking about Marsha as I was growing the flowers and writing her letters. And viewing hours came to be as this kind of homage to her and her struggle and her disappearance and um, her disappearance in his, in, you know, in the archive and, 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 and me being in the wake of that. And so it, it was really just a kind of improvisation, intuition, gathering of, of, of materiality, of the materiality of, 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 of my life and of the dirt that I was working with, the compost, that's live compost. There were worms in there. There were um, I went down to the um, flower market where Marsha had, you know, would get her flowers for her flower crowns. And I was able to get free flowers. I think I got like five dozen roses from uh, some of the, the, the flower vendors because once the flowers turn just a little bit, they, they throw them away. So, I, you know, I was able to get up early and get down there and get as many flowers as I could. And I even talked to one of the vendors whose father remembered that Marsha and it was really beautiful. And um, I think it links to, you know, of course the, the history of activism and ACT UP and, and just the way that the, the growth of, of these histories has to be tended. You know, the growth, the, the actual I feel as an artist that I have to tend to the archive in a way that uh, no one else is going to tend to it because they don't have that kind of personal connection or experience. And so um, the way that I had set up the piece was like that. I, I just invited, it was very intimate. I invited a few people not not more than five that first um, that first time I was under the compost. It was over fifty pounds of compost. I was under it for two hours, and people would come into the kitchen and um, they would be served tea. They would have a moment of hearing my voice recorded, asking them, um, "Can I get a witness?" And then they would be led into the room with me and, and you know, smell the smells and perhaps um, touch me if that was something that they felt and uh, be with me in silence for 15 minutes and then they would leave and then the next group would come in. So it was uh, a process and uh, one other aspect was the music. I used Mahalia, ja Mahalia Jackson's I Come to the Garden, which is a song that I grew up with because I grew up in a church. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if it was wake work in, in, in the same, you know, in the way that Christina Sharp talks about wake work, but maybe it was it, it, I think it was a play because I was in repose. I was actually, uh, I did not open my eyes. <laughs> I was in repose um, and I had to regulate my breathing because um, I would hyperventilate otherwise. And so it was definitely an endurance practice. 
And uh, so I felt like there was this interesting kind of interplay with, with uh, surrendering to the weight of, of, of the material and the weight of the, you know, the histories, um, the weight of the archive. And so maybe it was, maybe it was a, a, a multi-layered kind of work around being in the wake, but I was also sometimes transported out of, of the actual space, right? Um, and my relationship with the people that were there, it was really just sensorial. <laughs> And so there was an interesting kind of sensing and feeling, um, feeling oneself with others. And just the, the just really, really, really minuscule movements and of someone shifting their weight or, um, you know, just coming a little closer or moving away from this kind of massive mound of compost and dirt and decaying flowers on my body and decaying food waste, <laughs> or not waste, but food um, scraps. And so I think I'll leave it there. I'd love to see, I've seen um, Guadalupe's work and I'd love to get a sense of how all of this work <laughs> the 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 laying our bodies down in 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 this in these different kinds of ways how it how they all might interconnect thank you so much we'll come back to all of that um <clears throat> uh, thank you everyone for being here on this rainy uh evening here um yeah so the the way I look at my practice, I feel like I'm, I'm I'm a gardener, right? Like I think about just watering the plants, watering uh, the art, like just the artwork feels like it, and have patience with it, um, make sure that it has light, right? The same goes about my own mental health, my own spirit, my own body. I take care of it. Um, I also feel the same way about my communities, uh, whether it's students or friendships or the undocumented community, the cancer community. I'm a cancer survivor as well. And to me, it is all, it's all connected. Um, I feel that um, the, the trauma of, of being one of the first, first wave of undocumented children unaccompanied to come to this country in the 80s uh, turned into a cancerous tumor for me. And not that everyone that goes through that migration is gonna have cancer, but this is how trauma translates to different types of illnesses. And I've seen it all over my family. I've seen it from friends. Uh, untreated trauma can manifest into an illness. Um, I've, those experiences have been my biggest teachers. I learned so much from them. I met so many healers um, in the process and it's been a quite like a learning kind of experience for me. Um, and it is like the, the same care that I put into my work when I'm working in the studio goes to how I'm kind of constructing these these um, these safe spaces, uh, at, at especially now that I'm working with uh, collaboration with Juan Carlos Ruiz at this uh, church in, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Um, the, you know, the community there is mainly undocumented and, you know, we were there uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and it was kind of like, we had to move like several mountains to kind of um, do the work that we did. Um, and that involves like literally carrying uh, hundreds or thousands of pounds of, of grains like every week to raising money, uh, just to be in, being there as, as like a support uh, for people that are just arriving out of detention centers, right? And they're arriving in, in the church asking for help um, and just trying to network and try to figure out where to give them help or to send them like these kind of things. Um, but also be there as spiritual guidance, right? Uh, the pastor would let me every Saturday, we did sound baths and all the healing work that I do with my healers walk in, walk in there and do the healing work for people that are just getting out of ICE detention. Um, and, and to me, like, again, everything that I do is like learning, how do I grow from this? How, how do I evolve as a person? 
Um, and then after that, uh, we have this new crisis that we're dealing with. Um, you know, we are, I think we have around maybe 20,000 uh, asylum seeking refugees that are arrived in the last four or five months in New York City. The shelter system is over flooded um, and a lot of them are coming to the church um, and, and we're there. And you know, the church is not set up to be a shelter. Um, the first time I showed up, I was gone for a week and I showed up and I had 50 people sleeping in my yoga mats and my blankets that I use for, for the ceremonies that I perform there. And I was like, well, we wouldn't even have cots. And the toilets broke down because of the constant flushing of 150 people there. The stove broke down because it was running 24 seven. Um, and where are we getting money to feed all these people, right? And the state and the government st is still not helping. Um, so I started the GoFundMe and I've been doing ceremonies for them, you know? And th this is like the tricky thing, you know, they come, most of them are from Venezuela. Um, I was born in El Salvador and I had similar migratory path as they, I mean, it's like halfway, they had done double, double the journey that I did almost. Um, but what's really like the most disturbing thing is that th these governor in Texas is releasing only the Venezuelans, the Central Americans, people from Haiti, people from Mexico, all, all over, they keep them locked, locked up in ICE detention. Some of them have been locked up for years. Somehow the Venezuelans land, they only, they're only the only ones that get out free. Every, it's like a political agenda that, that more, it's completely morbid that this man has. Um, I don't know, I, don't, I can't figure out what it is, but all the Central Americans, everyone else, they're locked in months, even years in ICE detention. Venezuelans get bused and sent over here, DC, um, sorry, Chicago. And I don't know what, what, this, uh, what, what this person is thinking. Um, they, I think he's using them as political pawns for whatever reason, whatever the agenda is, is really morbid and disturbing. Uh, whatever it is, we have 20,000 people in New York, the winter is coming, they show up in shorts, there's families, there's children, right, that are arriving. Um, so, you know, and, and again, like I, I'm there and I'm also like I'm making art and I'm just like doing like doing a lot of different things. But to me, it's all it's all connected. Um, I'll share a story with you guys uh, from one of the 19 year old refugees. He wanted me to tell you guys the story. He actually told me to tell everyone the story. Um, so he's 19 years old from Venezuela and he he came here three and a half months journey by land and with no money and he had no parents. And he came here in, by land from uh, Venezuela to Colombia, to Panama, to uh, 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 Panama, uh, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, all over Mexico. He was kidnapped twice and somehow got out and didn't have $1 in his pocket. And he said he made it all the way here because he knew how to connect with the goodness of everyone's heart. Everyone that he spoke to gave him an opportunity. Even when he was kidnapped, he talked his way out of it because he made the kidnappers laugh and they let him go. He found a soft spot in everyone's heart and that's how he got here. And like that gives me so much like, I'm like, what? <laughs> like, right? So um, I was able to put him on a plane with the money that we raised and reunited him with his family in Tampa, Florida. Um, I don't know if I'll ever see him again, but he was like, tell everyone the story. This is the struggles that we're going through. And that's one of millions of stories, not just worldwide, of course, right? All the migration that happens. But just listening to that story gives me so much hope, right? It's just like, wow, like if he did that at 19, like what can we all do as, as a collective, right? So it gives, just gives me a lot of hope. And that's why he wanted me to share that story with everyone here. Guadalupe, would you mind um, just going through a few more images for those who may not be familiar with your work? I would hope most are, but um, just to give people a sense of yeah, um, so, your sound baths. Yeah, so basically when I was um, battling cancer, I came across uh, the vibration of, of the gongs, but I, was, I knew about sound as medicine for a long time, but it helped me get through my radiation treatments. Um, the body is over 60% water, and in the water we carry a lot of stress, and the vibration of instruments or, or music 
helps us release the toxins. So this is a lot. This is something that I use to release a lot of the stress. Uh, and do you want to go to the next image, please? Uh, so this was last year at Socrates. We had over a thousand people in a lot of these ceremonies that I was doing. Uh, we had a, a fire keeper in the center that was collecting anything that anyone was releasing. Um, and we had about eight stations with these instruments and the sound was really took over the whole space um, outside. And I work with in a collective of a lot of healers. I usually don't do the work myself. I have a whole, a whole beautiful team that, that works with me. Uh, next image, please. Uh, this is the one that we did, and that's one of my giant sculptures in the back. That's a healing instrument. Those are things that I make. Um, disease throwers. Disease throwers, yeah. And this is a ceremony that we did at Socrates, and it was um, only for cancer survivors or anyone that relates to cancer. And that was like a really beautiful, probably one of the most beautiful days of my life, to be honest. Um, we had actually had an open mic to anyone, anyone that wanted to share their cancer stories. And also at the end of the ceremony, we came, I asked anyone come to the fire if you're willing to uh, connect with anyone here. And there was cancer survivors that had really rare types of cancer, people with cancer, and they all connected and shared and, and really kind of came together and kind of continued to communicate afterwards. So it was like a meeting point. Uh, next image, please. Uh, yeah, and this is the sculpture at the Brooklyn Museum. The show just went down last week, and that's a disease thrower, and uh, that's a, it's a vibrating sculpture. So I have someone lay inside of it, and when I play the instrument, the whole sculpture vibrates, and it's a, it's a type of a vibrational healing instrument that I invented. So a lot of my new sculptures are vibrating healing instruments. Originally, it was made for someone that was he uh, hearing impaired or deaf, because they couldn't really experience a sound bath. So I made sure that I would be able to reach everyone. So I made this vibrating sculpture that someone can lay in there and feel the vibration, even if you can't hear the sound. But because of all the research that I'm doing, I realized it does more than just that. It, it is like a really powerful healing instrument. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, um, Guadalupe, and I think, you know, one of the many through lines across all of this work, obviously, are these questions of, you know, grief and loss and survival and how all of you have also used that as a framework for knowledge sharing and sharing tools, lots of different kinds of tools for addressing these things um, and the role of sound and language in various forms in that practice. Um, so I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that in whatever way you're inspired to. And it also makes me think about the ways that each of you has really used and expanded kind of whatever institutional frame that you're working with as a way to kind of facilitate these experiences that go beyond how these spaces are typically used. I mean, I remember during the pandemic, um, being isolated in Dallas and you even did a sound bath on Zoom. <laughs> and I never thought, you know, I had experienced your sound baths in person and they're so incredible and such a healing experience. But even on Zoom, I remember I like passed out at one point. And I was like, I can't believe, I never thought I would experience Zoom in a kind of healing framework, you know, it was a really a, a first and only time for me, I will say. Um, and then Mayfield, I mean, hearing you speak about this work, it's in incredible to think about the kind of endurance. I mean, you talk about endurance, the endurance of sitting with, and I'll say laying <laughs> with yourself in this way that I think there's no way of not kind of contemplating your mortality in that context. And I know that there's even a kind of zine version of viewing hours that is in this format of a kind of funerary card um, that includes one of your letters to Marsha and also a letter to Julius Eastman. And, you know, we hear this expression, you know, bring me flowers while I'm alive. And here you are laying here, but also thinking about these kinds of histories and the losses that we've experienced through the HIV and AIDS crisis and through, you know, trans, <laughs> trans violence, violence towards trans people. Um, and all, yeah, all that's kind of in that space. So the grieving of also what could have been, um, 
I would love to hear about, and also just thinking about you doing these performances in these spaces, you know, these spaces that are not the usual spaces of performance. Um, I just found that really, really striking. And, um, and I also think about your work, even with doing these kind of flash collective workshops, which I think build on the knowledge that you have from your work and you share that out with other people as a ways of kind of inciting maybe disruptions in other spaces and for people to think about what it means to take collective action. Like we could do a, a flash collective <laughs> workshop here if we wanted and think about something. I might get fired <laughs> for whatever we could, <laughs> we, you know, we could think about what that means in the space. So um, I like to blurt out a lot and hope that there's something to, to catch in there to get the conversation going. Can I just say, um, you've all blown my mind and we've only been here for a couple of minutes, but I think that um, the, the hidden secrets inside of histories are things that we, there's no way to document, um, even though the, all of us probably in this room are obsessed with, with documentation or sharing. And the idea that I lived in a city that wasn't always um, pre-gentrification, wasn't the city that New York is now when the New Museum was on Broadway and Marsha Johnson was everywhere. Everyone knew Marsha. It was a part of the world and the idea that um, it's only recently that people have been reminded of the importance of somebody who lived on the streets of New York when it was possible to live on the streets of New York and be a part of a community or multiple communities. It's inconceivable now that uh, since NYU has bought up all of the real estate in the Eastern West Village and made it impossible for artists to ever live here again, it was possible even up until the mid 90s to move to New York and not have a career and not know what you wanted to be and make a mess of your life and have a job waiting on tables and pay $300 in rent. It's like it didn't, the New York that we are sitting in now was not the, not always that New York. And I think the, the work of the two of you and well, and the way you have um, contextualized it really is a part of this idea of New York as a work in flux and the body as, <laughs> as a work in flux uh, and mortality as a work in flux. And I think it's very much in forms like the practice that you've just described. You've blown my mind. <laughs> I, oh, can I say something? Yes, please. <laughs> yes, yes. And we would love to see um, and kind of hear you speak through some of the other images you brought um, today. I think that would be Yeah, really sure. Um, I just wanted to say something in response to the this kind of fluctuating passage of time and... I, the the letter that I wrote, so I had been writing letters to Marsha because I was so pissed off that I was in New York as like this little queer kid in 1992 and I didn't know, like it was like, I was almost like it was this misconnection, you know, like she passed away right before I I got there. Like and then and then I didn't even know, you know, about like <sighs> and the year before that Julius Eastman had passed away. And so when I was at the kitchen, I was like, wait, Julius Eastman was here. <laughs> And Tiana McClaudin had just done this incredible archival work about Eastman. And um, I was just like, I, I, 
I need to write both of them a letter, you know, like a love letter. And, um, and I think that that's, that was part of the work too, of like realizing that they, they were never forgotten, but they were forgotten. And there's, there was this whole, you know, in terms of, you know, something that I, I, um, really struggled with this year is just, um, overwhelm, you know, just being an artist and, um, already dealing with depression and then just, you know, having, just going mad, literally going mad and, 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 and realizing and recognizing that these, these, you know, beautiful people who I really loved, Marsha, um, Julius, Nina Simone, I mean, they all went mad. And, and so part of the, the work was also like this kind of healing work of calming my nervous system, being under the weight of all of that, you know, organic material was also a way for me to um, really slow down. And um, so this year, for the first time in my life, I took a month off. I took a mental health break. And um, it was really powerful. And I feel like that kind of like what you were saying, Guadalupe, like, that that's that's it's just there's no separation between this kind of these moments in life that are, are teaching you know that are giving us material um, on just on just how to live you know um, and also maybe how to how to how to be in the liminal between life and death and and then you know also how to die and so like I think there's a beauty and and understanding the temporality of uh, these, uh, yeah, the temporality of, of these archives. And, and it connects to the uh, another work that I've been working on um, called Whale Fall, which is also about decomposing grief. Um, and this is actually an image of a whale fall. And the whale fall is uh, a phenomenon where when whales die in the ocean, um, they they literally feed the they feed the organisms and 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 they feed uh, other sea creatures as they're falling, and then once they get to the ocean floor, they create an entirely new ecosystem. It's like, you know, a huge event in, in the ecosystem of the ocean and um, specific worms and, you know, octopus, you can see the, all of the creatures there um, and bacteria uh, feed off of the, the bones of the whale. And this, this project, came out of viewing hours because I couldn't get the compost during the pandemic. <laughs> and right when I was starting a new pro a, a new project um, at Abrams, actually a new commission at Abrams, I was going to try and do viewing hours, but I didn't have access to the gardens that I had worked at because they were a lot of them were closed. And at the time, there had been a huge um, mass beaching of whales, like the, the, the largest in the history of, um, it was in the, in Taz, off the coast of Tasmania, almost 400 whales. And I, I, I just happened to read about this and it just touched me. It was really, it felt really um, tragic and, it reached into my soul and I was like, oh, these whales. And I kind of went down this rabbit hole of researching whales. And that's how I found out about the whale fall. And I just want to say, and also take a moment of pause that um, just this past week, 500 whales um, 
also pilot whales were beached off the coast of Aotearoa, also known as New Zealand. New Zealand. Um, and many of them were not saved. So that that's something that just came up. Um, but out of this whale fall uh, project, I've been researching these mammals and I'm also a vocalist, so I've been singing whale songs. And uh, the next slide is um, a film still from the piece, uh, for the film, Whale Fall, that I performed at Abrams Art Center and made, a, made it as a film. And um, Something that I learned about whales that was really beautiful was that um, they're connected to this symbol um, called the mandorla, which is also connected to uh, the magical spinners of thread, who were mostly femme people, um, also matriarchs, and then that connects to whale communities, which are matriarchal communities. So in this film still, I started um, knitting as part of the intro scene. And after the knitting, I'm kind of starting to dance and move into the light. And the next slide shows that progression. And then you can kind of see the knitting <laughs> on the floor. And then the next slide is where I start to build a kind of ship and with the knitting and there's whatever was in the theater, that's what I used, a broom. I used the, the push brooms and was just dancing with everything um, in the film. And after I, completed the film, I went on to create another piece that connected uh, this idea of decomposing dance and, and the whale fall and the matriarchal connections to that. Um, and I started putting braids in my hair and using that as the kind of tether to the ancestors. And you can see that in the next slide. And so I have my hair braided, but then I had also been saving hair. And that's the long um, tether that you can see there. And this piece was actually um, an opera that I made um, in June at Dance Space Project called Sensoria and Opera Strange. And it was really about calling in again um, the whale fall, singing the whale songs, dancing with um, a my deceased dance partner who was HIV positive and died from complications of HIV. And so the whole, you know, again, I'm in this place of mourning and, and but also calling in the support um, of my non-human kin. Um, just like similar to viewing hours. And then the next slide, um, I'm kind of starting to move into the space of decomposition and disintegrating into what I call the oil spill, which is the set piece behind me. And um, I think that last slide shows one aspect of the piece that, that actually it's just my shadow when I'm dancing and I'm it, to me, it feels like it's some it's kind of submergence of being in the abyss. And um, yeah, and so that was, that's been the work. It's been, um, it's, it continues, it continues. And 
I feel like a huge part of my work is is really connecting to this kind of um, ecological sensibility. I and I'm starting to think about it as like a a mindset of um, of just embracing the the non-human as as my as my kin and really finding ways to um, communicate with them. And the most beautiful thing happened just a month ago, I was in the Seattle area and for the first time in my life, I saw a pod of whales just off the beach. <laughs> like literally, <laughs> like they just came, they, they were orcas, they were just going by and, uh, that to me was like everybody, everybody talking to me. Marsha was saying hi, <laughs> Julius, all of them. They were all with the orcas um, who are highly, highly um, vulnerable uh, right now. Thank you As, for that. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I might leave it there. And I know I want to give time for people to ask questions if we have time for any. Do we? I'm going to get the the sense of that. And I also want to invite you all to reflect on each other's work and ask each other questions as part of this too. Um, what's, how much time we got? About 10 minutes? Okay. And it goes by fast, doesn't it? Oh my God. Like there's so much, so much more to say. I, I just wanted to point out based on some of the things that you just said that the, the thing that we are trained to forget or to ignore is that history is capital. So uh, ownership of our own past or ancestry or how we deal with healing is all a part of the system of ownership. And I think that, that that's a thread that connects all of our work and your work and the, the new museum as well. Um, I just wanted to point that out as a light motif that I, I've learned so much in this conversation, but it's one of the things I've been thinking about and I think relates to the conversation we're having. I hope this becomes an opening for all of you to remain in dialogue and hopefully for all of us to be in future conversations. Yeah, hey, my name Hi. is hey, my name is Georgia Lale and I'm an activist and, and an and an artist. I'm sorry. This conversation get me like I'm gonna I'm gonna get a heart attack. <laughs> um, and I work a lot with issues of migration. My grandfather was a refugee from Turkey to Greece, and I'm also a cancer fighter. I have an aggressive form of thyroid cancer, and um, I really like the conversation. And um, you all talked a lot about healing and. Um, um, sound healing and performance and activism and creating communities as part of healing. And um, I'm not a spiritual person. And sometimes I get a little like, um, you know, trying like I'm pushing back to those like ideas, but I do find making art and talking through art about those issues to be a spiritual practice. And I just want to thank you all. That's all. That. Oi, Claudia. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. It was so uh, beautiful and emotional talk. I've never been to a talk like so emotional. Thank you, Vivi, for putting this together. I just wonder, I'm going to start with Guadalupe, but maybe this goes to all of you. When your work goes to a major museum, you just had a major show at MoMA, uh, and in a way it becomes objectified because it has to be. So how do you connect that to such a different experience that you brought here for us today? Um, I don't see it any different. Um, yeah, it's MoMA, and I performed 50 sound baths for, at MoMA, and we had closed door sound baths for only cancer survivors, right? So obviously I can't bring the undocumented community to MoMA. It doesn't feel like a safe space for them. But uh, there's a lot of cancer centers around MoMA. 
So we reached out to the cancer centers and we provided healing work for people that are dealing with cancer. Um, so that's kind of like how I work. Every institution that I work with has its uh, um, challenges, right? So yeah, this giant monster, MoMA, yes, I, I think I did some good things in there. <laughs> yeah, I think that was part of my um, my question too about you know how, how to use these institutional spaces and those resources to do the work that you do. And I think even starting with Let the Record Show as this example of something that I think many in ACT UP were kind of skeptical of, I think, including you, but ultimately you made the decision of using that platform. And I'll bring up this other anecdote briefly of, you know, Target using <laughs> the silence equals death um, logo for half a second before it got taken down. And you uh, commenting at some point, you know, like, you use whatever, you know, whatever means are, are given as much as, you know, that's an incredibly problematic use of that maybe it also becomes a way for for someone to learn about the meaning behind that. Yeah, I think that the um, what we're all talking about here is consciousness raising, and I think that everything is political, but it's also uh, the idea of ownership of history. It's something that we all own. It doesn't matter that you didn't know Marsha P. Johnson, you knew Marsha P. Johnson. It's like we're just trained to think that we're not entitled to our own stories or the meaning of ideas, or you brought up the Flash Collective. I do this project where I assemble a group of strangers and we make a work of art to be mounted in a public place about a, a political issue within a limited amount of time. And I've become very convinced after doing dozens of them, that you could get on the F train in Queens, in that car, make a flash collective, and by the time you get to Brooklyn, you would have not just one work of art, you have 10 works of art. We're just taught that we're not supposed to make art, but that doesn't mean that art isn't in all of us, which I think is kind of what you were saying. Hey, yo. Um, my name is William. I used to work at the Rubin Foundation. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Mayfield, I just want to say that working with you to produce viewing hours was like one of the highlights of my career. It was so incredibly touching. And, you know, there's a lot in activism about life and death. And I don't want to get like too abstract and, you know, go into, you know, what that means to me or the definitions of because there's so many definitions but Mayfield one thing about your piece and just having it at the eighth floor that I thought was so incredibly touching is that as there is heaviness and there is death and there is mourning and there was darkness but I just want you to know in that performance there was so much light the space was so full of light and it was so full of life as well I sometimes think that death is just as living as life is, you know, and I, I, I want you to know that you embodied this presence and this beauty that I've never experienced. So I just wanted to thank you. And I wanted to thank all of you for just, you know, making that space so incredible and continuing to make these spaces so great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, William. That was beautiful. I almost want to end there, but we'll, we'll make space for some more. No, go ahead. <laughs> Hi there. Um, thank you all. This has been an amazing talk. Um, one sort of thread that, I mean, there are a lot of threads that jumped out to me um, as you each were speaking, but there is a, in each of your practices, there's a channeling of, of personal experience and personal pain um, in a way but also in a practice that reaches out to connect to others and is, is striving towards connectivity on a larger scale and creating community. And um, if, if it's through the letters, if it's through outright activism, if it's through sound baths. And I, you also all touched on the idea of, of being an artist plus something else, whether that's a certain identity or a profession or a hobby, but that 
you kind of straddle two worlds. And I'd, I'd just like to hear from, from you about the relationship between your practice and whether sort of the community aspect and building community came later or if that was sort of the genesis for your um, artistic endeavors. Um, I, I don't separate it. It's all the same thing to me. Um, I, for all I remember, I, I, I was living a civil war in El Salvador and I was drawing, right? So it's like, in, it's in me from the beginning and it has kind of evolved in, into the person that I am now. Um, everything is connected to me. I don't separate anything. You know, I mean, I think like, um, you know, it's not the fifties that we're making abstract paintings and we're getting into fights in, in bars, you know, and you still consider a genius, right? So, you know, so it's like every, we're responsible for everything, every action that we do, uh, right? How, how we connect to our families, to animals, to nature, to society, to our work, to our students, to our peers, everything is connected, our ancestors, everything, right? So I, I don't separate anything, so yeah. It's it's all it's all one thing. I think uh, I think that's a really good question. It's kind of the f fundamental question in a way. But I was raised in a family where the world was more important than any of us in in my family. So it, it made it possible for me to think about making work that the entire world could own and use in multiple ways. And I didn't need to have control over it for it to have meaning the meaning came from the world so i agree with you it's like the we're trained not to think that way but some of us are born that way and um as a consequence that is the entirety of my practice my life my interests um it's what stimulates me and terrifies me is the world that theoretically I'm delivering something to, but it really isn't a process of delivery or genesis. It's really a process of seeing and lis listening. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in a um, fundamentalist evangelical church. And so um, everything was you know, church was life, life was church. Uh, and then I left that church and had to figure out what I was going to do. And um, I think something that I didn't realize then that I realize now is, is this idea of sacrifice. And that that was really instilled in me as a child that you need to sacrifice yourself to Christ that was what they instilled in me and I don't do that now I don't sacrifice myself to God but I do feel that when I work that my work is is an offering and um the practicality of you know what happened in my life in terms of work and I grew up working class so I always had to have multiple jobs as an artist. And and one of the jobs that I that I one of my first jobs was teaching gardening to kids in Oakland, California. And then I basically did that for years and and I was also dancing and then one year I just decided I wanted to quit dancing and go work on a farm. <laughs> And that was a good that was a good two years of my life. And then I realized that I was an artist. I'm not going to be a farmer. So I nice. just, you're both. So I'm both. <laughs> but I wasn't going to like go do that farming thing. I was going to I was going to do both. So to answer the question, um, that's what happened. That, that will be the final question, so make it good. Hi, my name is Sebastian. Thank you so much uh, to all of you because uh, what I've seen is that we have the, the healing, what has been mentioned before, but I say 
like uh, she mentioned, sometimes depression, so the, the healing of the mind. Then with the hand, the healing of the body there, that process in which you were drawing. And then we have the healing of the society. So I see the three things, and it's, it's been an ama amazing evening because we could, you know, put put all those three things together. And I'm seeing when it comes to to the society because I, I'm um, an immigrant myself. You could tell by my, you know, Shakespearean English. <laughs> and um, I see that. But my question to the three of you is this: because uh, there is the art and the process of healing the society in there. So what is the tension between those two things? So what is the proper mixture that you think that that is happening in your practice? What I'm trying to say is that, let's say that we completely eliminate society. You, you are Robinson Crusoe, you are just in an island. Would you be doing the same just for you, given that it's not society around what what is that tension thank you holy fuck that is such a good question um and you should be up here with the microphone um i think that the i think the misunderstanding about artists is that we make art because we want to we make art because we have to and we would be doing it whether or not we were acknowledged for it or got anything out of it or or became famous for it and i think that that's the the mistake that the cultural mistake we make is listening to what we're t how we're told to be as opposed to following our instincts about what we need to be anyone else want to add anything yeah um for me like i mean that's a great question um there's a lot of work that no one sees that I do, right? Every morning I do an hour and a half ritual, which includes meditation, movement of the body, self-care, self-love that I give myself that is daily. And and doesn't matter what's happening, right? I just, this is what I do in the morning. Um, that's part of the, of the practice, right? There's so many things that happen in my studio when I'm making work that no one sees, right? Just the care that I'm giving the work. Um, you know, they see the sculptures at MoMA or whatever, right? But no, they, all these things need to happen, right? Um, for myself and from the work. Um, so, yeah, so like the, if I was not island by myself, I would continue to do exactly what I'm doing. But I, I do, I would be missing my community, right? But maybe my community would be the plants or the nature or the animals or whatever it's around me, right? So, yeah, so that's, to answer your question, yeah, I would, I would continue. Yeah, just just that's a beautiful question. And, and my overall practice is improvising while black. So I'm always improvising. That that's all I can say. Like I just like it's just it's just that's just what's happening. That's I mean I'm up, I'm in the mountains in Switzerland right now. So <laughs> um, and I'm black and I'm improvising. And they're you're black in Switzerland at one a.m. <laughs> So there's that tension. The tension for me it feeds also feeds the work. Yes, that's good. Yeah, I meant to invoke improvising while black because it is the ultimate hack of life and the merging of life and art and how we navigate these things. Um, yeah, I mean the work is all relational, right? The question wasn't asked to me, but it it brought up this similar existential question for myself, like. The work that I do is very much about building these connections. And um, yeah, I guess maybe if I was on an island, I would be curating palm fronds or something. <laughs> but, <laughs> but maybe there would be some kind of, of dialogue happening there. Um, I want to thank you all for staying. I think maybe we went a little bit later than we were supposed to, or maybe we we're right on time. Um, it's really such a pleasure to be with all of you together. And I wish we could spend even more time together, but we'll leave it here for now. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone has a good night. I hope you go to sleep soon or have a good wind down. Mayfield, thank you so much for being so flexible and, and open to being in the space with us. Um, 
it's really, 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 really special to be here with you. Um, and thank you all. Looking forward to the next. <laughs>